Hello and welcome to the London Legal Podcast, presented by Hodge, Jones and Allen Solicitors. Our leading solicitors share their views on latest legal issues and developments, and how the law might affect you, because we care about righting wrongs and providing first-class personal legal services. So please enjoy this, the London Legal Podcast, presented by Hodge, Jones and Allen Solicitors. Hello and welcome to the very first edition of the London Legal Podcast. My name is Chun Wong and I'm the head of the dispute resolution team here at Hodge, Jones and Allen Solicitors. The London Legal Podcast will look at a wide range of legal issues that most Londoners will face at some point in their lives. So to kick things off today, we'll be discussing purchasing a property with my colleague Claire Kitchen. Claire, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello everyone. My name is Claire Kitchen and I've been a partner in the dispute resolution team since 2017. I qualified as a solicitor in the north of England in 2002 and specialise in high value dispute resolution, often involving property. Thank you, Claire. Property seems like a great topic to kick off the podcast with, as the property market seems to be one of the few things which remained on track during the pandemic. In July 2020, the Chancellor announced that there would be a temporary stamp duty holiday until the 31st of March 2021, a rescue package said to be worth about £3.8 billion. Claire, can you explain what this means for those looking to buy a house? Yes, of course. When you buy a property, you have to pay stamp duty land transaction tax, which is called stamp duty for short. And this usually applies to properties costing more than £125,000 or £300,000 if you are a first-time buyer. Now, there are various bans depending on the property's value and additional charges on property that isn't your principal private residence. To put this into context, let's say that we have someone in London who isn't a first-time buyer, and they're looking to purchase a £495,000 property as their home. They would usually have to find an extra £14,700 in stamp duty. However, to keep the property market buoyant, stamp duty has been frozen until March the 31st, 2021, as you said, Chum. And this means that properties valued at under £500,000 are temporarily exempt, meaning that our example buyer now does not have to pay any stamp duty at all, saving almost £15,000. £15,000 is clearly a substantial saving. Put all this into context... New data from the Office of National Statistics showed London properties now sell for an average of £489,000, an increase of 3.5% in the year to August 2020. So stamp duty holiday clearly affects a lot of potential homeowners, especially those in London. There's now a rush for people to take advantage of this holiday, and given the high figures we've spoken about, most people in London looking to buy a property will only be able to do so with someone else whether a partner, family member or friend. However, before you embark on the biggest investment of your life, there are some important things to consider, which we will now discuss. Claire, how can two or more people own a property? There are two ways in which people can hold property together. The first is known as joint tenants and the other is tenants in common. And why does it matter, Claire, how you own a property, whether that's joint tenants or tenants in common? Well, the property is treated differently as to whether you hold it as joint tenants or tenants in common. So, for example, if you own as joint tenants, when one of the tenants dies, it automatically passes to the other party. And that's outside of any estate. And if you own as tenants in common, your share will be decided either by your will or the rules of intestacy. And I must point out here that there is a difference between legal and beneficial title. So, Claire, how do you reflect the type of ownership you actually want, whether that is joint tenants or tenants in common? Well, you should be asked by your conveyancing solicitors how you want to hold the property. And you have to select this on the documentation that transfers the property, which is known as a transfer form or TR1. If you're going to be tenants in common, you may need to enter into another document, which is called a deed of trust. And if you're tenants in common, there is usually what we call a Form A restriction on your title at the land registry. Thank you, Claire. Does it matter what you plan to buy the property for? For most people, it will be their home, but for some, it might just be an investment. 
Yes, it can make a difference when things go wrong and a court tries to decide what a fair remedy would be for the parties. One consideration that a judge would take into account would be the purpose of the purchase. Do the parties always have to buy an equal shares, Claire? No, absolutely not. Although, unless stated otherwise, if you are buying as joint tenants, then it is assumed that you are buying an equal shares. And how do you reflect those unequal shares then, Claire? This could be reflected in the document I referred to a little earlier, which is called a deed of trust. It will also depend on the intention of the parties at the time and what discussions or agreements the parties have had. And ideally, all of this should be documented in writing to avoid arguments and disputes later. What happens then when circumstances change between the parties? Well, this is a common issue. Things can and do change. Ideally, the parties should have thought about all this at the time when they were planning to buy. So any scope for change should have been considered at the outset. You can change the way the property is held from joint tenants to tenants in common or vice versa. And you can change the legal ownership from joint tenants to tenants in common by severing the joint tenancy. To change from tenants in common to joint tenants is slightly more complicated and you will need the agreement of all the co-owners and you have to decide if the remaining party should have the right of first refusal to buy out the party wanting out or should the property be sold and the proceeds split. And what happens if something goes wrong? Well, things do go wrong and that's where we see most of these cases where parties have fallen out. Hopefully, despite any personal disagreements, properties and issues related to the properties can be agreed amicably. But we would suggest you seek legal advice immediately about protecting your position if you do own a house or property with someone else. There are lots of remedies that a court can provide that are available to uh, disputes over co-owned property. So, for example, a court can make a declaration as to who owns what proportion. The court can order that the property be sold and the court can also carry out an accounting exercise showing who's paid what. Thanks, Claire. Finally, do you have any top tips to share with our listeners? The first point is that you should always get the right advice from the right professionals before embarking on the purchase of a property with someone. Each purchaser should get independent mortgage and legal advice separate from the other co-owners. In that way, everyone is aware of all the consequences of co-ownership and can take appropriate steps to safeguard their interests. If the property is to be legally held by more than one person, a lender is likely to refer to all legal owners are party to the mortgage so that the bank are fully protected. A good idea would also to set up a joint account and from that joint expenses for the property can be paid. Also, the parties can trace which party has made what contribution. And if you do pay into a joint account, it may be a good idea to reference each payment made. So, for example, new boiler or service charge payment, council tax, that kind of thing. That's very helpful, Claire. If the property is to be your home, extra protection may be available to people who are married or in a civil partnership. This and other aspects of your relationship can be properly dealt with in what we call a cohabitation agreement. Please do make sure you tune into our next episode where the family team at Hodge, Jones and Allen Solicitors will be explaining cohabitation agreements in further detail. That concludes the first episode of the London Legal Podcast. We hope you have enjoyed it. We also have a blog on this topic with more details and advice which our listeners may find useful. The link will be below. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. And of course, if you found the podcast useful, please do share it with your friends and family. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the London Legal Podcast, presented to you by Hodge, Jones and Allen Solicitors. To listen to more podcasts, follow us on SoundCloud or visit our website www.hja.net for interesting opinions and the latest legal information. Or if you need our help, call 0808 2780 216.